Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading researchers and nutritionists meet over a few drinks and casual conversation to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal agriculture. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, and I'll be your host for tonight's discussions. Earlier this week, the American Dairy Science Association held the 39th ADSA Discover Conference. The theme of the conference was the transition period from physiology to management. And with us tonight is the moderator of the physiology session, Dr. Heather White. Dr. White is a professor at the University of Wisconsin specializing in nutritional physiology. Dr. White, welcome to the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour. And in keeping in that theme, I see that uh, you've got uh, something there in your glass. Would you mind sharing that with us? Hi, Scott. Thanks and welcome. Yeah, I'm uh, having a whiskey old fashioned, so... Sticking nice. with Wisconsin. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know how you hate to drink alone. So, Heather, I've brought myself an Aberfeldy uh, 12 year. Uh, I'm, I'm typically a bourbon drinker, but uh, recently started sampling some scotches and absolutely loving it. So we're going to we're going to stay with that trend for a while. So, uh, Heather, if you wouldn't mind, would you give us a 30,000 foot overview of the physiology session you moderated this week? Sure. Myself and some colleagues had the chance to kick off the Discover Conference uh, with the physiology topic, and we tackled some issues on insulin resistance and glucose partitioning, as well as fatty acid nutrition and hypocalcemia, all of those intricate balances that influence the cow physiology right around parturition. Okay. Now, I see you've uh, brought a few friends with you here to the exchange tonight. Would you mind uh, introducing them to the audience? Thanks, Scott. Yeah, just to my right here is uh, Dr. Joe McFadden from Cornell University. And together with Dr. Maya Zakut from Volcani Center, they tackled issues of insulin resistance. So, Joe, maybe you just want to tell us a couple things going on in your lab recently. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Yeah, we're, we're focused uh, heavily on studying sort of glucose partitioning and, and early lactation dairy cows, trying to look at um, the endocrine control, but uh, more specifically, the, the role of sphingolipids. And so over the next couple of years, we're going to take this a step further and try to control sort of ceramide supply and early lactation cows through diet, but also some pharmacological approaches uh, as a way to uh, influence milk production. Great. It was really exciting to hear some of your research earlier this week. Maya, what have you been working on? Uh, so in my lab, we work on uh, transition cows and the interactions between metabolic stress and heat stress. And actually, all this uh, issue of heat stress it was not part of the scope uh, in this meeting, but there are really interesting interactions uh, between uh, transition cows and heat stress. And in the last uh, three years, I've been focusing on developing new methods in my lab to uh, understand uh, the subacute inflammation in transition cows and how uh, these... Uh, these uh, processes uh, are influenced by heat stress. Um, and I focus on adipose tissue. I use uh, many times the proteomic analysis as a tool to understand the physiology of the adipose tissue to get like an overview on the uh, pathways and the processes that are in the adipose tissue at different uh, conditions. And uh, in the last couple of years, I've been working on the endocannabinoid system, which is a really exciting uh, new thing. Um, and it's relevant for the cow at the systemic level and also the interaction with the adipose. The adipose tissue is really important for this uh, system. And it's um, really exciting to learn how the dairy cow, um, how this system is related to the dairy cow. And uh, the last thing that we do is that we try, I'm a physiologist, not really a nutritionist, but uh, we try to use different nutritional manipulations uh, to affect uh, dairy cow's physiology during the transition. <clears throat> and we work with different uh, plant-derived uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-oxidative uh, supplements or different fatty acids like omega-6, omega-3 to try to uh, affect the adipose tissue uh, in the transition cows. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing some of your work during the Discover Conference. We can't talk about insulin resistance without fatty acids coming up. And so one of the other colleagues here with me, Scott's Dr. Adam Locke at Michigan State University, and he shared some of his research on fatty acid nutrition during the conference. 
Yeah, thanks, Heather. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're, my lab's uh, all fatty acid based pretty much. In the last four or five years, we've uh, moved that very much to that fresh cow. So we're trying to better understand the role of different fatty acids and different combinations of fatty acids on nutrient digestibility and nutrient partitioning, obviously, with a goal of maximizing production efficiency, uh, minimizing body weight loss. So we got very interested in some different fatty acids and one in particular recently has been a laic acid in collaboration with work with Dr. Contreras here at Michigan State. And uh, so we're trying to understand the role that some of these fatty acids have on adipose tissue metabolism, uh, milk production. So, you know, our work, while my lab is very much on a more applied basis, ties in quite nicely with some that uh, Maya and Joe have both been talking about already at um, the more uh, more basic levels as well. So these things, I think, all start to sort of fit together quite nicely here. Yeah, great. It was interesting work you shared during the conference. So the, the session wrapped up with a talk on hypocalcemia, which at first doesn't necessarily seem like it fits. But my good colleague at Wisconsin, Dr. Laura Hernandez, uh, does some research in this area. And the more we talk, the more we find connections between glucose metabolism and the immune system and hypocalcemia. So it really fit quite nicely to wrap us up. Laura, you want to tell us a little bit about what you've been working on lately? Sure. Thanks, Heather, for having me. And uh, I did feel a little bit like the odd duck out, but there is a, a lot of research that is uh, likely going to tie the connections between hypocalcemia and energy metabolism. I've spent the last many years working on serotonin's influence on how calcium is regulated and um, the interactions with the mammary gland. I'm a lactation physiologist. I always qualify that I'm not a nutritionist, and I usually talk to Randy Shaver when I need a diet. So there you go. Um, so we've been looking at how um, the mammary gland kind of controls this pull of calcium into the mammary gland to make milk, and we're trying to understand the homo homeostatic and the homeoretic mechanisms that control this. Um, I've been recently working a lot with Dr. Milo Wilpink um, because we're interested in what's the cart, what's the horse, and is there really a cart and horse between energy and, and calcium? We know that calcium can lead to issues with ketosis um, and other energetic disorders as well as reproductive um, outcomes, but we don't really know stepwise what happens. Uh, so we've focused on trying to kind of understand that, um, been doing some experiments to see if we can sort that out with some advanced statistical techniques as well. Um, and we're trying to, uh, we recently have been working on try to, trying to figure out what happens first um, and what the biological mechanisms are that are going um, with that to see if we can potentially figure out what happens first and what drives one thing or the other um, between what happens um, prior to parturition and then after. So that's been the focus of my lab and been doing a lot of crazy <laughs> physiology experiments. I have some amazing graduate students um, and hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have um, some ideas of what's happening there. So happy to be here. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll all be able to pull it together <laughs> eventually, um, but it's a great um, area to work in. So I, I was excited to be a part of it. So thank you. Heather, why don't you bring the audience up to speed on what's, what you're doing in your lab? Yeah, thanks, Clay. So we've been working uh, on quite a few different things. You know, like Laura mentioned, sometimes they seem unrelated. And so you put them all in context of each other. So, of course, we always focus a lot on the transition to lactation period, looking at nutrient partitioning. So different energy precursors or nutrients that we can feed that help the cow better partition better meet the demands of lactation as she goes through transition. But we've extended it a little bit as well to look at feed efficiency, both during the transition period and during mid-lactation. We've been doing some interesting projects uh, where we can influence feed efficiency during the transition period, and also digging into if metabolic disruptions during the transition period influence feed efficiency through the whole lactation. So feed efficiency is a concerted effort globally, and it's something that I think a lot of us uh, can contribute in one way or another. Certainly the aspect I bring to it is, is focusing on nutrient partitioning. So Clay, you were at the conference. Uh, what was your take on the session? Were there hanging questions you had left after listening? 
So, yeah, so the, the conference was excellent. So, first of all, I want to give, I want to give kudos to the program committee for uh, really pulling together a great conference in the, in the face of COVID and having to do a virtual conference and flex to that. I, I, uh, I thought the conference was excellent with, and, and there were great opportunities to interact. Yeah, that's good to hear. During the conference. Joe and I were on the program committee and, uh, you know, what we signed up for was an in-person Discover conference. And we actually met during ISRP in Germany last fall to have an initial meeting. It happened to be that several of us were there at that conference. Um, and, you know, we had these grandiose ideas of discussion and round table. And then COVID happened and we got an email one day that said, hey, we need to meet and figure out how we're gonna swing this. And so I think Joe would agree, we went through a lot of different iterations in our mind of what it could look like. And we were all pretty relieved that the participants really engaged because it, it was up to everyone to, to make it successful. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 well, Heather, I missed that time in Germany, that's for sure. Life has changed. Yes. <laughs> I had a lot of positive feedback from people. They, they thought it was uh, very engaging for being a virtual format. So maybe maybe to start off with the insulin resistance topic, um, maybe uh, may, maybe have a little discussion about. Um, we'll go back. We'll go back to Rick Rick Rummer's talk that uh, that he did uh, recently. That's out, out there as a YouTube video. So so insulin resistance is it uh, the title of his talk is insulin resistance friend or foe? Maybe maybe you could each comment on that. Your, your your take on is insulin resistance in the transition count. Yeah, I can I can start there, Clay. I mean, I think uh, it's it's a term that often could be um, associated with poor health outcomes, and I think a lot of that bias comes from just knowing the world surrounding diabetes, type two diabetes. But cows don't develop diabetes, okay? And insulin resistance serves a real critical purpose to support milk production. And that's the same type of insulin resistance that develops in um, pregnant women, late-term pregnant women, I shouldn't say late-term, but third trimester uh, pregnancy. That, that serves a purpose to give glucose to the growing fetus. And in the cow, it's the same thing. It also helps to serve, provide glucose to make milk. And so I don't want to say that a cow that's more insulin resistant is at um, increased disease risk. I don't think that's really clearly been demonstrated yet. I think we need to rely on a large body of research over the last four decades that's shown that these mechanisms occur in all cows to serve a critical purpose, and that's to make milk. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, insulin resistance has a bad reputation. It doesn't sound good, but it's actually really, really important for the health of the cow and the normal physiology. But on the other hand, I can't really agree with this view that the cow is doing great and we should just let her be because I do think that, um, and maybe this is a bit of like the European influence that I'm, you know, in the Middle East, so I hear, <laughs> I get some more uh, European feedback, but um, I do think that we are, we need to be aware of the cows that are less resilient and that adapt, adapt less well. And even if they have high milk yield, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're fine. Um, and I think that uh, when we do, uh, and usually in research, we only f figure out which cows are insulin resistant uh, to a higher degree relative to the other ones. I do think it's indicative of their physiological state. And I think that this is a way for us to understand, and you can do it with different ways. You can also just uh, like see how much body condition score they lose or the degree of lipolysis. But I do think that there is evidence in the recent years that there is a connection. You know, if, there, if we think about the work by a, uh, Andres Contreras about uh, macrophage inflirtation in the adipose tissue, which was also shown by man. So I do think that there's a relationship between uh, cows that have a, a severe lipolysis and for sure adipose tissue inflammation, which I don't think uh, is good. To, I'm talking above a certain level, you know, when it's a normal, uh, limited in time and limited in degree phenomenon, then it's fine. But there are cows where it becomes too much. And I do think that this is like my point on this insulin resistance issue, that it, it, it's a matter of degrees. You know, if, if you have a little of it, then it's fine. If it's transient, it's fine. But there are cows that I think, and I think that uh, in next years when the milk production will continue to increase, uh, it could be uh, that we might, if we, we have to pay attention to this because we don't want to get to a stage 
where there, we have more uh, cows that are less resilient. So we have to somehow either learn how to adjust maybe by diet or different uh, ways we have uh, to help these animals or um, just be aware of it. Because I think that uh, these cows that are less resilient or I, I, I heard that people don't like that I use the term high metabolic stress, but I do think that um, at some degree, if it's a matter of welfare or well-being, um, it is important both for us as the, because we all can agree that a happy cow gives better milk, but also for the consumers, you know, we want to have the animals uh, happy and in good shape. So I do think it's an issue that we have to pay attention on. And that's my um, view on insulin resistance. It's okay, but it's, a, it's like a marker for us that maybe things are starting to get uh, out of control and maybe these cows need more attention. So, so my so, so, oh. so, so I, have, I have a comment regarding that, Adam. I mean, to me, it's, I'm trying to separate the inflammation from the insulin resistance. Like, I'm not entirely convinced that the, 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 the reason why these fat cows, these high mobilizing cows, cows that are at increased risk for disease, I believe that's more attributed to the inflammation less than the, the, in, the insulin resistance. I don't think that's really been teased out yet. What is really the driving force in that? And my, I would put my my money on the on the inflammation. But I, I just want to ask, uh, I think that sometimes when I talk about adipose tissue and also it happened with, uh, when I asked Travisia question during the meeting, I'm not talking, you know, these high mobilizing fat cows are not, I'm not talking about uh, obese cows. I'm talking about like cows with body condition score of three, they look normal. You can't, when you look at them at the late pregnancy, they look the same, but uh, obe the fat cow syndrome is something different. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the cows that are in normal body condition score, optimal in our view, but they, still between them, there will be cows that eat less and there will be higher mobilizer of adipose tissue in the fresh period. And these are the ones that I think uh, are problematic. And, and, and the other uh, way to look at it, if you, know, if you want to be positive and think about uh, you know, keeping things um, amazing. The other way to look at my data is to look at the at the other half of the cows that do it and they succeed. You know, we have these cows that are able to eat enough and not lose a lot of body uh, condition score or body weight, uh, and they they do much better. So maybe our our focus should be on how can we increase the proportion of the cows that succeed on giving high milk and not losing a lot of uh, condition score or body weight. Um, and, and that's why I just want to separate. It's not just a matter of obese cows. Okay. So I think I'm going to bring it back out a bit because we delve pretty deep there. Um, the way I think about this is when you say insulin resistance, friend or foe, it makes it very binary. It's either good or it's bad. And so I, I'm with, I'm with, with Joe on that, that, you know, insulin resistance, a degree of insulin resistance is a natural homeoretic mechanism, right? You know, all mammals have, that's a part of you know ent entering lactation and it they need to do that and i don't think we necessarily want to minimize it completely you know when those cows are not going to perform so well then so well i don't like the binary term because to, the, to me and that's what maya is saying it's about degrees of insulin resist um, insulin sensitivity right so a, a a degree of insulin sensitivity is absolutely necessary and i think is important and that's something we may want to manage and maybe we talk about this later as we go through lactation as well um but i don't you know but and then a high producing dairy cow isn't necessarily overly insulin resist sensitive or insulin resistant and i totally disagree that a high producing cow is stressed that I, I know Mario and I have already had some discussions about this, but I don't like the term saying high production equals stress. I mean, I think that's fundamentally wrong when I think about what any animal does under a stressful condition. You know, production productivity is one of the last things, you know, that happens. I like to think of a dairy cow more as a, you know, a highly tuned athlete. Um, and you, we have to get everything working together or they're not going to, you know, maintain high milk production, you know, Get, go back into positive energy balance as soon as possible and all those things so um you know there are cows where insulin resistance you know does go too far and we can run into these issues but just saying insulin resistance is bad i think is fundamentally is fundamentally wrong there and it's trying to better understand as my was saying you know some of these cows you know why is this cow doing well and this cow's not doing well maybe at, at, at similar levels of intake and, and some of those things and trying to understand the phenotypic and the genomic you know basis of some of that 
I also it's, it's funny, sorry. Uh, just the the example that you gave a top athlete, I also gave it in my talk in one of the breakout rooms. I think that similar to, to the top athletes that can't do it just by being with good genes and uh, practice, they need like a support system. So that's why I think this is our role in research and all the people that work in the industry to understand that the cows that are these high yielding animals, they're similar to the top athletes in the means that they need all our work and all our support because they can do it on our own. That's what I'm a bit, uh, you know, I don't think that if we just let things be as they are, uh, we could wake up in five years and the situation won't be so good. I think that's why it's so important to continue and understanding what kind of new uh, strategies we can do in order to help them maintain this high level of production. I think too, there's a lot of integration that we've missed because we've compartmentalized like in where we're working and, you know, the integration of what's happening with insulin and lipolysis and calcium. And I don't think there's been, you know, enough research where you're trying to figure out the overlap and what one thing might be driving in the other. And that was the goal of one of our projects. The last one I, I touched on that we're still just in the middle of analyzing like thousands and thousands of samples, but that was part of what we were trying to figure out is like, with the six hour sampling, can we look at what's happening with insulin and glucose and calcium and then using these techniques to try to figure out what might happen with one versus the other? And, you know, what is homeostatic and what is homeoretic? Because I, I think there's a lot of integration and that might be part of where like you have one cow that's fine and producing a lot and maybe one that isn't. And maybe we could piece some of that stuff together because there's an integration that we're missing potentially. So I think all of this comes back to, and, and Laura, you hit the thought with integration. In my perspective, it's about alignment, right? So we have to have some insulin resistance so we can have glucose sparing. And that's also what allows for mobilization of body stores of adipose tissue when she's in negative energy balance. But then the rest of the body has to be ready to receive it. So the mammary gland has to be ready to receive, uh, you know, those milk fat precursors and alternative energy sources, whether it's using the glucose directly or relying more heavily on BHB and the liver has to be ready to, to, you know, use all of those fatty acids. And if we have misalignment there, so if we have good genetics, but poor nutrition, or if we have good nutrition, but poor management, that's where the cow can't align it. Right. So, you know, with Adam stepping back here again, you know, if we look at it from a big picture, we have to equip the cow to align because her genetics may tell her, go, 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 you have high genetic milk production and you're going to be insulin resistant, you're gonna mobilize fat and the mammary gland's ready to, to synthesize a ton of milk. But if we haven't set her up nutritionally and with good management, she's gonna fail. And then the converse is true. We can have the best nutrition and management in the world. The cows will still max out when they hit their genetic milk potential, right? So whether we're saying alignment of all three of those on a stool or we're talking about an athlete that has to have you know, all the training in and then also the right diet the weeks before and the endurance. I, I think it's all contributing. And like Laura said, we got to look at the whole picture, right? And that's hard because we're all trying to dig really intensely into one question to figure out mechanism. But at some point, those studies that let us look at everything together are just as important. So friend and foe, Clay. Clay, we can't hear you over all the noise in this was, bar. Yeah, I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> I did not realize I was muted. So, so I'm curious how much of this um, how much of this dysfunction is is starting prepartum. So 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 Laura, in, in your case, can can you predict prepartum? Which, is there a way to predict which cows? Um, as they approach calving, we'll, we'll have hypocalcemia, more severe hypocalcemia. So that's the goal. That's what we why we did that study. It appears at least preliminarily on our ionized calcium. When we have the positive DCAD and the negative DCAD, you can see the separation about 72 hours prior to calving where the negative DCAD cows have a higher calcium concentration than the positive DCAD cows. Um, and when they go in and they calve, the negative decad cows go down, but they come back up in what would be a normal transient activation of the of the system that's going to help you drive calcium. Um, 
I'm hopeful. <laughs> and that was part of why we sampled every six hours starting about five days prepartum through um, four days postpartum that we can come up with something or several somethings that would say like, you know, three, four days prepartum, if you potentially ran this, we would know like what their output might be after um, calving because I really don't think measuring ionized calcium or even total calcium 12, 24 hours at calving is really going to tell you what's happening because you don't know where you are on the decrease or if they're coming back up because you don't know where she's at. Um, and I'd say like, you know, it was really neat to be at a conference like last year with Jess McCart and we started talking and what she was seeing in the field is what I was seeing with like this intensive sampling. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we can, we can find something beforehand and hopefully we can also help try to maybe sort out how it's integrating with energetics um, or adipose tissue mobilization or potentially re poor reproductive outcomes as well. So um, that's sort of the goal from that project. And then we're starting others to try to see how we can put all the pieces together because you can line everything up and say like this number tells you potentially they're going to have metritis or they're going to have a DA or they're going to have ketosis, but it's not really what it's telling you. You know, I don't know. So that's, that was the purpose of that, that experiment. So hope to have lots more information. My student has um, been running assays <laughs> day and night since they let her back into the building. <laughs> um, so uh, she keeps telling me she's slow, but she's really not. She just has a lot of blood samples. Hopefully I don't have to buy another min minus 80. We're up to four. I don't know where we would put a fifth. <laughs> so so along, along those lines uh, related to lipolysis is... Is uh, is lipolysis that's occurring prepartum? Is that predictive of the amount of lipolysis that will occur postpartum in these cows? Yeah, I think we we've started to do look at that as well. Obviously, we're focused on lipid metabolism, and we've done we've had two studies to date um, where we looked at how far, how early can we detect fatty liver disease or ketosis, and we don't really haven't published any of that yet. Um, Obviously, focusing on uh, my interests are on phospholipids, uh, circulating phospholipids, and, and phospholipids in the liver to better understand sort of the role of, of VLDL secretion and when that's failing to contribute to fatty liver disease or or ketosis. And we've always compared NEFA, total NEFA, and keto and BHB, and th those are fairly predictive, at least in, based on our two studies. Um, uh, they're from prepartum NEFA and ketones. Are predictive for postpartum outcomes, uh, and I think Tom Tom Overton has shown some of that as well. Uh, we're just trying to improve that, and it's a, it's been a bit difficult to find something better than that. But there are things that that are popping up that to show a lot of promise. Yeah, I just want. Can I just? Oh. So I was going to say, Joe, is that when you know Clay's saying about lipolysis? When we're measuring blood need for that's not necessarily. A marker for lipolysis per se it's just more the balance between lipolysis yeah. and lipogenesis isn't it so yeah you know i guess that that could be impacted by either either side of that story right you sound just like one of my reviewers <laughs> oh okay <laughs> oh, you're absolutely right yeah just call me r1 okay <laughs> <laughs> which was the best review joe uh -huh. oh yours r1 best? Oh yeah, yeah, that was me. Uh, I, I have a feeling you all have been my reviewers at one time. <laughs> oh, I have. I don't. I haven't reviewed any of your papers for a long time. I <laughs> so I just want to add with this uh, thing with lipolysis, and if we can uh, find out these cows, we actually showed a couple of years ago that uh, the degree of body weight loss in the early postpartum period is repetitive uh, among along lactations in the same cows. Uh, we examined like 100 cows at the Volcani farm and we showed that from the second lactation onwards to like the fifth or sixth lactation, the cows that tend to lose uh, more body weight, we have daily um, weight scales. So the ones that uh, tend to lose more body weight during the first month, it's repetitive also in the third and fourth and fifth lactation. So I think that, that this fits well with uh, Friggin's uh, work on... Uh, this thing that I think it's an intrinsic trait, and it also I think makes sense that, and it shows that I think that it has some genetic uh, 
background. Uh, so that there are cows that, that, that tend to do to react in this way, and it could be a matter of like priorities um, in how the cow manages uh, its balances within the within the animal. Um, and and that, but but uh, specifically in Israel, uh, in our setting, the cows, the late pregnant cows, don't really uh, have a, a sharp decrease in their intake uh, towards uh, calving. I'm, I think it's maybe because our uh, nutrition is very, our diets are very different than the American diets. So we actually don't see, we have, when we measure like individual fit intake in the transition, we don't see uh, a part of like the couple of days before calving, we don't see a long decline. And that's why I'm a little bit, I want to check my data, but I'm a little bit skeptical that uh, this decrease, if I relate to what was said yesterday at the meeting, I'm not sure that the decrease in uh, intake in late gestation is what causes inflammation because we see the inflammation, but we don't really see the reduction in intake uh, towards calving. So that's something to check. So Maya, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. So, you know, we hear over here a lot about, you know, how do we minimize that drop in feed intake? So how are your close-up diets? How do they differ to, to U.S. cows? Maybe that's a somewhere to to look at more from an applied uh, basis how do your most up you know i'm not a classic i'm not like a nutritionist i also have my colleague uh, that helps me with the diet so i can i'll send you later the information but <laughs> i prefer not to talk too much about the diets but mm-hmm. and just <laughs> but of course uh, in israel because we're a desert country the diet is very different than the american diet uh, they have much more uh, concentrate in their diet, and also the late pregnancy diet is very different. So it could be related. So oh, I am curious about that comment, though. I remember having this discussion decades ago with with Rick Grummer, and um, you know they would they would see this classic dropping trimeter intake in his studies there. Um, at the time, this was back in the '90s, and you know. We we were tracking uh, some commercial herds, and you know, in some cases, not seeing nearly as much decline there. And even uh, we had our own research herd where I worked at the time. We we did not have nearly as much of a decline in dry matter intake. Uh, you know, even that last week or so. I'm I'm curious what you're all what you're all observing uh, in the research you're doing. How, how much how much decline in dry matter intake are you seeing in your studies? Um, those last few weeks? Well, our studies, we mostly have been focusing on uh, the fresh cows, so we don't track the dry cows so much, um, so we don't really see that so much. I think the other thing where I think in general, and you know, I'm fighting some of these dogmas in some of my research as well, we have to be very careful nowadays, I think, about extrapolating about research done in the 80s and 90s as well, um, because typically cows were calving in a lot heavier that back then, high, much higher body conditions score. And we, we've known for a long time, you know, that, that link between body condition score and uh, feed intake, um, you know, in, in, um, straight after calving. I think my PhD advisor back at home first showed that in 1980, um, Garnsworthy. So um, I think we have to be careful, you know, maybe maybe one of the things what Maya's saying is maybe they do calve their cows in a lot a lot leaner than many cows here in the US. And that could could be a simple factor around some of the the differences in um, in seeing or not seeing dry matter intakes. So probably I don't know if those drops are as severe now as they would have traditionally been uh, back back in the those days that research was being done. Well, and reflective of that drop not being as severe now, we don't see as much body condition score loss. So Milo Wiltbank had a really uh, really good study together with Paul Fricky, and they had hundreds of cows in there and they grouped them by if they lost body condition, maintained or gains. It was quite shocking how many of them didn't lose any body condition over the transition period. And we know that that's, you know, one of these markers we talk about in that study, I think it was only 40% of the cows lost body condition over the transition. Laura, do you, am I off with 40%, but I think it was 40 lost I, I can't remember the numbers top, and maybe, off the top of my head, but it was very pronounced. Yeah, 20 or 30 maintained, and then the remainder actually gained a quarter point. But that's what I'm meaning, that we have a population. It's like, in, in, in my studies, it's like 40% of the population are doing really well, amazingly. They don't lose all this body weight. So that's why I'm trying, we should focus on, a, 
having their proportion higher because how are they doing? I guess it's related to higher intake, but it's not necessarily because when we measure the individual feed intake, sometimes we don't see a difference. So in one of my papers, I start to think if, if the dry matter intake is similar, maybe it's a matter of like basal metabolic rate or utilization of the feed, like more complex processes, not just that they eat more. Uh, because it's not uh, always apparent that they eat more, but yeah. I think that we're like it's coming up to the surface that there are cows that are doing much better than we would expect. Also, if we just measure like the calculated negative energy balance, we also have a, a group of cows that are not in such a severe negative energy balance, and they snap out of it within a week from calving. And it's not like in the classical literature that it's the first month or first uh, first three three weeks. So, you know, we're, uh, I was going to say, Heather, some of those studies, I'd, I'd really like to do some more research or see some more research around cows that are gaining body condition in the fresh period. What's What are they doing milk production wise? Because yeah. we still have to maintain a balance here from a very applied basis around maximizing milk production and production efficiency, yeah. reproduction efficiency. And, and, and there's a balance here. You know, are we robbing Peter to pay Paul at some point here? Um, I, I struggle to get through my head cows that are gaining body condition in the first few weeks after calving where are they on a production wise compared to a cow that may be maintaining or, or losing I think that's something that we need to do some more work on in the future yeah well we probably need, we need to look at energy correct in milk really right because as they're mobilizing that adipose tissue it's a high transfer into the in the milk fat, right? Yeah, yeah that's a good the point. Other, yeah. The well, other place I think there's a disconnect between research and, you know, in the field, Clay, you were talking about uh, privately owned dairies and following those data is in research, we are feeding something that's been formulated for that group of cows. So we're feeding very specific, maybe we're feeding them in tie stalls so there's no feed bunk competition, or we're feeding them in a Kalen gate or something. Um, whereas in a private setting and we have this huge pen of cows and we're feeding all of them. And I was a part of a collaborative project where we looked at how we could regroup cows. And it's when you put it on an energy basis or a protein basis, it's ridiculous how many cows in any pen are being over or underfed. So it may be something as simple as that. The ones that are gaining body condition through, maybe they're being fed more on average than their individual requirements versus the other. And this has really gotten me thinking about going back to the question earlier, how would we predict problems? And we talk about NEFA and, and all of these crazy markers, and that's great in research, but we all know it's expensive, it's time consuming, and you're not going to get an answer quickly. So it's not going to be translatable to the field. One thing we've been trying to do is predict individual cow feed intake in a group setting. Can we figure out how much feed each cow's eating in a group pen setting? Because I feel like if we knew that prepartum together was something very easy to do, whether it's body condition or NEFA or whatever, but we had their feed intake, I think that's a missing part of the story and could tell us which cows are going to go through and lose a lot of body condition, but make a lot of milk or lose body condition and not and crash and those that are going to maintain, but they're gonna be a steady milk producer on the other end. And I think it's most probable that, the, like uh, Adam said, the, these moderate cows, the ones that don't gain body scoring, but I think that they're probably, I, would, it's, I think it's a good guess that they would also have a better reproduction. So obviously we don't want the cows that become fat and don't give milk, but I think that the moderate cow, in the sense of uh, maintaining the, as much as she can, uh, her reserves, she will also have better reproductive performance. So, Adam, you want to give us a quick summary on, you know, what you've been finding as far as fatty acid nutrition in transition cows? So, you know, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, we've been sort of uh, challenging some dogma here, and the, the traditional dogma has been don't feed supplemental fat to fresh cows because they're already mobilizing body fat, so what, why feed more fat, right? Um, I think there's a number of sort of biological differences between mobilized fat versus absorbed fat, fatty acids. But we've been, again, trying to get away from this concept that fat is fat and, and fat's not just energy. 
um, trying to understand the role of different fatty acids or different blends of fatty acids. So we've done a series of studies now, mostly in the fresh cow, focused around palmitic acid and oleic acid. And a lot of our ideas there were around formed from uh, post-peak cows with different levels of milk production and effects we're seeing on energy corrected milk, body weight change, plasma insulin. Um, so we're, we, we've done some work with palmitic acid in the fresh cows um, where we've seen consistent improvements in energy corrected milk, but they have lost a bit more body weight, which as the discussion we've just been having around the table here is could be an issue, right? And um, we, we've looked at that from our applied side. Uh, Andreas Contreras has done some work on the adipose side. Jo Joe's done some, um, taken some samples from there. Um, we then started coming in with uh, some of our interest with oleic acid, and that's where I think it's quite exciting from our perspective, where when we come in with a more of a balanced blend of palmitic and oleic, it seems like we can get nice improvements in milk production, but we avoid that additional loss in body weight. And in, in one of our studies, we actually saw improvement, uh, less body weight loss than, than the control cows. Um, and we've also been seeing some uh, pretty impressive carryover effects. So if we fed treatments for the first three weeks, what I, we would call maybe a traditional fresh period for a dairy cow, <clears throat> even at, at week 10 of lactation, we've still seen over four kilos more milk in those cows where we were able to bump production in the fresh period. And, you know, uh, Barry Bravis done some work with... Um, with different compounds um, in, in that very early period. And there are other examples of this as well. Mike Allen's done some work as well. So I think that really does put a focus on that fresh cow. If we can get her set up uh, metabolically to, to um, help improve milk production, that we can have some long lasting carryover effects on there. And um, so we've been doing some follow-up studies recently about, well, if we can, get a nice boost in fresh can we get a boost again in the peak period with some of these blends and, and, and that work looks promising as well but um sort of tie in with with joe and maya here andreas um, um here at msu has done some work with oleic acid where we've done abomazing infusions in fresh cows we started to see that maybe oleic acid has some specific effects on lipolysis lipogenesis in adipose tissue and maybe also some effects on insulin sensitivity of adipose tissue so that's kind of really what excites us right now um but obviously i think it has a real practical application which is where i normally come from is from that practical side is you know i think we can be looking to feed some of these different fatty acids in fresh cows and it can definitely have some benefits on milk production we've got to be careful of, on the body weight for some of the other discussions we've had here um but uh, we should be looking at some of these fatty acid supplements in the fresh and in, in the peak periods here. And <clears throat> again, fat's not fat. It's not just energy. Um, and we have to be talking about what type of fatty acids. And, you know, I think we're scratching the surface here now, you know, more from the applied side, the real basic side that, you know, some of the basic and applied side that Joe and Meyer and others are looking at as well. And, you know, where we've gone from crude protein to amino acids, I think we're, you know, going from dietary fat to now fatty acids. And I think in the next few years, we're just going to be, looking at formulating diets on fatty acids and not just, just fat. So quite a long rambling around the table here. Yeah, I got two questions here for you, Adam. Or, or, and one Good. of the questions was well, not even my own. I, it, was a, it was a decent question I had in one of the breakouts. And so think about oleic acid improving insulin sensitivity. And, and you've got this data where you're looking at energy partitioning between adipose reserves and, and milk production. Now let's throw in the immune system. Mm -hmm. um, and what and how glucose is being used by the immune system. There's a, there's a fatty acid like oleic acid have the potential to influence the ability of the immune system to use glucose. Oh, that is a good question. I think I need another drink before I answer that one. Um, I, honestly, Joe, I, you know, as an academic, we hate to say I don't know, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, I think you know, the work of Doug Mashik and others are really starting to sort of better understand, you know, the role that oleic acid may, omega-9 has as a signaling molecule, like omega-6, omega-3s do. Um, you know, I think that's, that, that's something we need to look at more. You know, I guess if we're improving insulin sensitivity of adipose tissue, that hopefully may be sparing glucose to be uh, used in, in other tissues as well. But... Uh, I really don't know the answer to that. How did you answer that question? 
Well, I, I, I try to think about how immune cells use glucose, and I don't know all of the immune cells. I'm, I'm trying to play catch up on that side of the mm -hmm. education, but the, uh, you know, lymphocytes, uh, T cells, I know, will take up glucose independent of insulin. And so if you had more glucose supply, it's conceivable that the immune system would, would use it in a similar manner like the mammary gland. So there could, so there could be competition between the mammary gland and some immune cells for that glucose. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just, I don't know, but it's, a, it's certainly a good question. And then uh, the other question that I often get is, okay, take an oleic and compare it to other unsaturated fatty acids like omega-3s, like 183. I mean, I, I, I'm under the assumption that 183 is going to behave very similar to oleic. And it's probably going to be a bit more potent at doing, at doing what oleic acid does. Would you agree? or? <clears throat> I, I don't know if I agree directly that they have the same biological effects because, I mean, they're going to have different downstream products. You know, I mean, that's... That... You know, I guess it, is that would all that almost be akin to saying, well, omega six, omega three have the same effects, um, and you know, and I think we know, you know, a very simple model, you know, omega six pro inflammatory, omega three anti inflammatory. I know it's more complicated than that, but where does omega nine fit in there on within omega six, omega three? I don't know all of that. I think this is this sort of newer area of a lake as a signaling molecule, but. Does it, you know, and at the same time, just saying omega threes. Um, someone mentioned something in one of our breakouts a while yesterday about um, using linseed for linolenic acid instead of EPA and DHA. But that's more complicated than that as well because of how slow it is to convert eighteen three to to EPA and DHA. Um, so I don't know where oleic acid fits specifically within that picture of of these other omega fatty acids that, that's a jolly good question um but i think it probably have their own unique effects i mean that the same i mean so would a ceramide from palmitic acid have behave the same as a ceramide from stearic acid oh yeah but palmitic acid has, would produce more ceramide than a stearic acid would yeah so that's i guess that's kind of my 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 challenge there is i don't know if i would just clearly say oleic acid is going to behave more like an omega-3. Yeah. So I, I don't know about that. And I, I tend to... Yeah, sorry, Joe, go on. No, I just, I just from, from what I know, and obviously a lot of this is based on my ruminant stuff, but I tend to categorize those omega-3s as insulin-sensitizing fatty acids. And so you know, okay. any more of an insulin-sensitizer than oleic? I don't know. But how would it... Maybe. So then, you test... know, then, yeah. So the other p piece of this story is we have to think about the rumen as well. Um, and maybe where a lake fits in somewhat more nicer here as well is that in general, a lake is less toxic to rumen bacteria. So maybe we're more effective at getting a lake past the rumen than we are some of these omega threes. So um, we have to kind of, you know, balance that side of that up as well. So, Hey, so I have a question for you, sort of following up on some of that, then, Joe, Maya, um, Laura. You know, we, I heard a lot this week about the requirements for the immune system for glucose. Uh, but I remember someone made a comment to me a while ago is that um, the immune system needs a lot of amino acids as well. And so, do, you know, are we, should we just be thinking about glucose requirements for an activated immune system or are some of these other nutrients? as important or is that mobilization of you know lean mass in the animal is that you know is that supporting the immune system there as well well i think obviously sorry Laura, the most uh, obvious uh, answer regarding fatty acids is the omega-3 their anti-inflammatory properties i think that's obviously if you feed the omega-3 fatty acids you expect to have these anti-inflammatory effects on on the system and the, it, the literature is a bit there are some studies that had a good effect, but some are not. There is some sort of uh, not enough data in vivo, I think, on this matter. But I think that for sure, omega-3, also, if we think about it as an essential uh, fatty acid, and I think that the cows in several uh, places in the world are deficient in omega-3 because of the more concentrated diet that they have. So that, I think, for sure is a, is a good example of a specific fatty acid that will affect uh, immune system. 
And you certainly need calcium too, because the neutrophils use the calcium for oxidative bursts early on in the first activation of the immune system before you get into adaptation. And clearly that's going to have some downstream effects. I mean, Jose Santos's data has shown um, some of that in relation to um, metritis at least. So that's definitely a part. And I don't know if it's that you put more in there, but I mean, I suspect it would be more to do with how you partition where it's going, so to speak. So that that's certainly something too, I think we have to think about. Yeah, and the amino acids is right too. I mean, glutamine, arginine, it's, I don't know a lot about these interactions with the, these specific amino acids, but I, I know they they play a key role in like uh, lymphocyte proliferation. So they're, they're make a good point. There's a lot of attention we need to put on that. Interesting. Thanks. Adam, I thought your potential reasons for carryover effect of fatty acid, targeted fatty acid nutrition were interesting. I, I wonder how much of it could be because different fatty acids have regulatory impacts on lipid metabolism, and glucose metabolism, and the liver itself. And then it could be part of setting up for success for the whole transition. So not just modulating insulin resistance, but regulating those pathways. So one of the things we've been looking at at a basic level is lipid metabolism. And we get all the NEFA in and these lipids are stored as triglyceride and then somehow they vanish, right? And this is pretty unique to dairy cows compared to other species, whether it's because of negative energy balance or demand or whatever. And there's, you know, there's two ways that can go away. They can be exported as VLDL, but they can also be remobilized is what we're loosely calling it and oxidized later. And so we've been looking at the proteins that regulate that and the regulation is different in ruminants than it is in other species, which is really intriguing uh, just in and of itself. But one of the things we found is that they're responsive to fatty acids, just like we know gluconeogenesis is. It's responsive to fatty acids by type of fatty acid, not just concentration. So some of the, the fatty acid shifts you're talking about are intriguing to me because we could, through a dietary intervention, potentially influence that, right? And allow the liver to remobilize the lipids and have a better nutrient partitioning balance between oxidation, storage, and gluconeogenesis so that the cow is set up to reach peak. Do you have liver biopsies from any of those studies? No, we've never, I've never done, we've never done any liver liver biopsies you should start. that that would be yeah, yeah I, that, that would be interesting yesterday and send them my way uh liver yeah. function index you know that what uh, dr trevisi showed yesterday about uh, measuring albumin bilirubin and uh what was the third one uh he showed uh, three measures that you can wow. pretty easily uh measure in the blood and get an uh indication on liver function so that could be like a indirect way to measure that without doing liver biopsies and on the fatty acid side, we have we have a, quite a few studies using uh, liver slices, so ex vivo, and, and a couple things planned looking at um, unsaturated fatty acids and how they can work to boost the liver's ability to make phospholipids for to, for VLDL secretion. So a lot a lot of opportunity. That's a, yeah. We need to, we need to talk. We should have another drink about that another time, Heather, and, and talk some more about that then. But, uh, I, I made a note yesterday or the day before someone mentioned about the role of fatty acids in early lactation on um, mammary epi epithelial development as well. So I made a note on that, but oh, maybe that's something we need to need to think more about in the future as well. So Laura well, would be our expert on culturing those. <laughs> or if you want mammary biopsies. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I can come do them for you if you want, Adam. Well, there we go. Wait, we can't travel out of state get... yet, can we, Laura? <laughs> <laughs> we could call it personal. <laughs> I went to do some biopsies because it's my hobby. <laughs> I needed a break from the computer or something. <laughs> yeah. So there was a lot. There was a lot of discussion during the conference, you know, about biomarkers uh, in transition cows. So I'm. I'm curious, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion during your section, uh, the second one, and even yesterday, a lot of discussion about that. Uh, I'm curious, um, these, are these metabolites transferred into milk at the very high?
high rates? Has there been a lot of work done with that with some of these biomarkers as far as detecting in milk, uh, especially in larger herds, rather than having to go and sample each cow, measuring these in the milk? Well, uh, I can take a first on attempt that? at that one, and Laura can tell me all the ways I messed up lactation physiology. Um, so we've been interested in this because fundamentally, our lab and many others are looking at biomarkers, but there's this huge limitation outside of research because you can't quantify them quick enough or cheap enough to make them an applied tool. No nutritionist is going to take a blood sample at minus one day to calving, send it out for $56 worth of metabolite analyses and get it back by the time she calves. It's We're just not there yet. I have a chemical auto analyzer in my lab and we still can't even do it that fast. Um, and I, you know, Trevisi had some great metabolites he showed, but you're talking about 50 to hundred dollars per sample when you get into these ELISAs for immune markers. And so we've been working um, several years back. One of the first things we did in Wisconsin was try to predict ketosis from milk. And so we made an applied tool out of that. It's, it's pretty widely adopted. And so that's, kind of started a snowball of what else can we learn from milk? When we take the, the milk infrared spec data, that's probably the most indicative. Um, but what we have found when they group fatty acids, so all this is proprietary, so there's versions of it from each of the main manufacturers. Um, it's probably not one-to-one -one the same as if Laura or I were to quantify it in the lab with what chemistry, right? but it's associated with something. So even if it doesn't exactly mean this is how much of this fatty acids in the milk, or this is how much BHBs in the milk or acetone, if we can associate it with the outcome, positive or negative, then it becomes a tool, right? So there's, there's, and Laura, I'm interested to hear what you think about this. We're looking at like energy metabolites, Mammary glands taking them up. Some of it comes into the milk. It doesn't exactly reflect what was taken up, and it doesn't exactly reflect what's coming out when you look at infrared. But it can be a useful marker because it's high throughput, it's quick, and it's something farms are already doing monthly, which doesn't help us a whole lot, except for we've had good success getting farms to do fresh cows weekly through their DHI lab. And that, that puts us in a different ballgame. No, and I, I think it's a great tool. And like Heather said, you don't get the one-to-one. -one. The problem with calcium is, is that it's really complicated to get a calcium concentration in milk. There's like perchloric acid digestions. It's not something you can do in an infrared. The other problem is, is that milk calcium doesn't change very much. So it's really hard to know if you would even detect a change. Um, and so we're uh, clearly, I mean, I'm interested in what's happening in the bone mobilization and some of those things. So maybe if we can get something really predictive, um, we definitely measure, we've run urine deoxyperidinolines and we've seen some associations with that and calcium. However, like Heather said, an ELISA for that is $800, which means like $60, $70 a sample, right? Um, and it's nice because it's in urine, you know, you could capture that really easy. You're not taking a blood sample, but right now we're just not there, at least on the, on the mineral side, because of what you have to do to extract it from milk um, or any marker in the blood. And hopefully um, with this big project I did, I'm hoping we can come up with something. Um, we're looking at potentially some energy metabolites that interact with bone like osteocalcin. Um, and maybe some of these other things that might help us at least understand more about the interaction with calcium. Um, and if we can, then maybe we can go to something like taking an infrared measure in milk that at least would give you a temperature of what's happening in a herd, right? Even yeah, I'm aware, like in the more uh, related to inflammation and immune, I'm aware of a couple of blood paper on uh, like de they're developing these days like sensors for haptoglobin for the acute phase protein uh, in milk and uh, you know the new technology of biosensors is crazy but maybe within several years it will be something that could be added to the milking parlor because if i think that haptoglobin has a really great potential to be a marker for us uh, in that sense well i think calcium even more 
so than some of these others, but with all of our discussion of how much of it's already predetermined prepartum, you know, we're not getting milk until day one, but none of those cows are going to the parlor and being tested through their DHI until they're three or four days in milk. Right. Um, one of the things I've started wondering, and Laura, it'd, it'd be great, maybe we should take some of these samples and align it with calcium, or maybe you're already doing it, but what about the last milk sample? We talk about the dry period, and so, you know, it's of interest, we're, we're getting ready to start a study and we're going to pull that data, but the last milk sample, maybe it tells us something, and I think it actually came up in one of our discussions during Discover, but... Um, you know, whether it's a change in, in milk fat or an energy metabolite or something that's in the last milk sample combined with something about her in prepartum that can be a good indicator so that we have the, the mark that she's at risk before she gets into that week before calving. I think that's a, you know, a great idea, Heather. There's another thing um, that uh, Milo and I are working on, and it's he's seen some associations, and you know Milo, he's got oodles of data from oodles of years like sitting there uh, I think he's published like 22 papers this year <laughs> I wish like but uh he when I was talking to him about this and trying to sort out like what's actually happening that gets you to the metritis or you know whatever um in that 10-day period um, he had some data from a course from like a thousand cows where he saw some associations with colostrum and um, so we've we've been starting to take that and run IgG and do bricks. Uh, we did just finish a study up at Arlington not too long ago, and it was manipulating some diets related to calcium. And we did see some um, positive uh, reflections in the IgG concentration that were indicative of a of a better calcium um, transition. So I think that might be one way. You know, that's something and if we could figure out to maybe like get the bricks a little better than the igg maybe that's you know one way you can do it if you're milking out a cow run the bricks and try to see what like how that associates so um we're working on that as an easier management tool because they're going to milk the cow out regardless right to get her colostrum so maybe that that would be an easy way too and a lot of them are doing bricks and if they're not it's not an insurmountable ask right you know? I think I did. I hear someone yesterday say about there there was a relationship between milk fat yield of the previous lactation. I think this is what you're talking about, Heather, and um, as a marker for nutrient partitioning in the next lactation. And I made a note of that. That kind of fascinated me. I, I need to remember I who said it and where it came from. Maybe it was yeah, you. I can't either. That's yeah. No, it was well, it might have been me during the discussion because we've been thinking about it lately, but I, I think somebody else mentioned it as well and I couldn't remember who. Well, Dr. Trevisi mentioned that he examined cows at 110 days in the previous lactation. Maybe it's related to that and connected it to uh, the inflammation uh, in transition. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to remember because someone was talking about late lactation, like the fat yield change or fat percent change in late lactation, but. We have the recordings. We can. Yeah, <laughs> we can go yeah. back. And, I hear the breakout recordings will be posted soon, so we can go back oh, and. No. Or not the breakout. Not the breakout. I'm sorry. The um the discussion, the live discussion parts. Of yeah. it. Yeah. That, that, that kind of fascinated me. That comment. Yeah. The one thing I took away, and I try whenever I go to these conferences, I try to take away one thing and and just try to act on it. And for me, talking to my graduate students about designing transition cow trials was something that I think I need to just have a, a better conversation with them about that and thinking more closely about criteria for including cows and excluding cows. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we've already done that. We do that quite nicely to begin with, but I think there's probably more growth there and certainly being, I said, transparent about it um, when, when we publish. I think that's something I, I, I'm taking away and I'm going to put a real effort to doing that moving forward. And the other thing I thought was because of all this individual cow variability that you talk about, um, I, I, haven't, I don't have much, much experience. I don't have any experience in genomic testing, but using genomics to try to better distinguish these, these cows or, or characterize our study populations could be useful. And they, and they do this very frequently. Like a lot of the uh, fatty liver work, whenever they publish a uh, a paper and they talk about the human population and there's known SNPs related to that disease. They publish that. And 
Um, I need to really work with geneticists um, if you, uh, to make that happen, but that's something also I'm thinking about. I was wondering what, what, what have you taken away? That What's the one thing that you think would change your thoughts or would change your approach? So Joe, can I comment on yours before somebody goes with theirs? Yeah. Uh, so this is something Kent Weigel and I talk about a lot. He is a geneticist. I'm clearly not. And we've had this question come up. Should we be trying to, you know, control for or at least account for the genetics of the cows on our study? And there's there's two things we've implemented or thought about or trying to implement. One, for feed efficiency studies, we have done some where we take the genomic predicted feed efficiency and we try to grab the two tail ends to have a more diverse population. The problem with that is that genomic feed efficiency and phenotypic feed efficiency are loosely correlated still. So that doesn't help us a whole lot when we actually run those studies. We don't end up with divergent populations, but that's just one um, marker. But for our fatty liver study, so we do these uh, inductions of clinical ketosis and clinical fatty liver, and we've been looking for markers. The problem is the markers we have found and the genes we're interested in are not on the SNP chips. <laughs> and the other challenge is, is we have gotten to the point with our throughput that cows are genotyped on three or 5,000 K SNP chips, and then it's imputed up. So any SNP that might be associated with it, maybe you'll catch it, but maybe when you impute it, you're losing it. So we would have to do a full sequencing you know, Sanger style, not a SNP chip. So all of our cows in our herd are genotyped, but that's of limited value if what you're using as a marker or the SNP you're interested in, like in the human work, isn't on the SNP chip. So anyway, I, I think it's really interesting. Um, but as far as the enrolling cows or not, Maya, you said something that uh, piqued my interest at the end of our session. You said uh, maybe only enrolling cows that are of a prime body condition score. No, you know, I misunderstood. I deny. <laughs> well, I well, had to write. I wrote after that. that I, I, that's not what I meant to say. And I wrote, like written a couple of like emails of correction to people oh, that no. I made the wrong impression. I did not mean to say that. Um, it's. I, I want to like clarify. You know, this virtual meeting thing. It's a bit you know unnatural in the way that you have to express yourself. So I think maybe I didn't uh, say what I meant to say. Um, uh, I do think, uh, like, you know, I focus specifically on adipose tissue physiology and obviously, you know, when, when, like, when we come and do an experiment in the experimental dairy farm and I need to do a study with transition cows, we have a limited amount of cows available. You know, I don't plan them five years in advance and I don't buy cows specifically for the study. So I work with the cows that I have. Um, and, and usually I, I don't pre-select the animals. I don't pre-select them according to body condition score. We want that range because especially if I'm interested in the variation in response, I want the thinner cows and I want the, I, I do, I avoid using first lactation cows because I think that they're different in their physiology. So I work always only on second lactation and upwards. And I also avoid like the really old cow. Sometimes I have like an old odd cow in seventh lactation. I won't use her because she'll be different. But uh, within the range, I do use all of them. I just, the, what I meant to say was uh, regarding uh, obese cows that when we study uh, the physiology of the adipose tissue, the obese cows, like I'm talking about like really like body condition score five, these ones will be different. So if you're working with a small number of, of animals in your group, and if it's like a nutrition study or you have a specific question, if you include, if you have like six cows per group or 10 cows per group and you have one obese one and, and you're interested in the adipose tissue, then she'll be different. That's what I meant to say, but I really didn't mean to say to pre-select the good ones. No, no I, I agree with what you say here. And I, I feel like, and to Joe's point, there's always a catch-22 because you want as homogenous of a population as possible. So you have lower variants because we there's only so many cows you can enroll because of limitations and expense. But on the other side, you want inference. So you want your study population to be somewhat reflective of the total population so that your results have inference. And I feel like it's always a trade-off, you know? So like Joe said, maybe we all just need to be more cognizant of it. I think one thing um, that, like, again, um, this was 
we were discussing data and um, one thing that Milo's really pushed me to do and I think a lot of papers are doing are graphing when you have the individual plots so that you can actually see the individuality. Like you have the standard error and the mean, but you can really see the range of what's actually happening. And I think that that's really, you know, a strong way to approach your data because then you can see that there really is a large bi biological variability. The other thing that I think when we were having that discussion um, that I think is really important and frustrating at times is when they don't want you to publish data that's negative or just like doesn't change. Um, and then you have people repeating experiments that don't need to be repeated. And I think, you know, adding all that data and being transparent is really important, you know, for all of us as we're formulating questions um, and trying to interpret what's happening. But yeah, we, we, we all, the biggest thing we do is multiparous cows and we balance for lactation within our treatments because we don't want an average of eight and an average of four. And um, that's really where we go with our, our experiments um, because we do want to see a cow that gets low. Like what are we doing and does that, does that help her or not? Like, could you rescue the effect potentially? So. So what did you take away from the meeting, Adam? <laughs> One thing I took away was uh, how little I know about lots of different things. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, what I think what I did take away is that there's people who are doing a lot of work and we're really starting to better understand different areas, right? So a key thing going forward is, I think, how do we integrate all of these different areas? And that's how we impact the farm gate, I think, is, you know, trying to take, you know, someone's work looking at this tissue or that tissue or this nutrient. How do we sort of bring that together and... Uh, you know, the importance of having the basic and the applied sciences, you know, come together. And that's how, you know, these meetings or these discussions we're having right now um, around a table, you know, I think uh, sort of helps or hopefully advance some of these areas. But, uh, you know, I think we, I learned that I think we've made a lot of advances since the last transition conference. Um, and uh, we need to put more, more and more of this into practice now. So, Adam, that's a great segue. Uh, this has been a phenomenal discussion here uh, this evening. I was wondering if, if you could each maybe um, give a couple summary points, may, maybe some key takeaways to be used uh, in the field, uh, e either from your presentations this week or, or just your research programs in general. Like a lot of us, we have these, 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 these focal points where it's fatty acids, amino acids, et cetera. But one of the things that I'm really trying to push forward, and, I, and I've done so for the, we talked about it over the past couple of years, is that I think there's a lot of synergy when it comes to feeding amino acids and fatty acids. Now that, that, would, that has to deal with changes in insulin sensitivity, changes in inflammation, milk production. So I think moving forward, there are certain amino acids, not just amino acids, but methyl donors. I should make the, the, the category a little bit broader that work well with certain fatty acids that get absorbed, particularly unsaturated fatty acids that could enhance um, liver lipid de um, ex export, um, improve insulin sensitivity in cows that are at risk for disease and in the fresh period. Um, and so moving forward, I think you're gonna see a lot more data on that, at least coming from me, but how specific fatty acids will work best with either with, with specific methyl donors. Thank you. Maya? Uh, well, the two uh, things that I wanted to say, the first one is that um, I think we should start looking at some of these uh, feed supplements like uh, nutraceuticals and uh, really uh, look at these uh, different opportunities to use uh, feeding as a way to influence the physiology in specific aims, like to think what we want to achieve and what kind of uh, preferably plant-derived uh, materials can uh, help the cow do that. So that's one point. I think that there's still a lot to learn about different uh, dietary supplements that can affect the physiology and specifically also the adipose tissue physiology. Uh, and th this is like a great opportunity for us to improve the cow's uh, physiological state. And the second issue is what some that, something that we didn't uh, really talk about in this meeting, but I think that it's very important when, if we, if we, we mentioned in, in our conversation today, uh, things that we can see uh, during late pregnancy. So I think that one of the big points in transition cows that was not so much focused in our, our discussion the last days 
is that the dry cows are really important and the management, you know, if I, my work um, is also about heat stress and I can't emphasize enough how important it, has, it is to have really good management and specifically heat stress management in the leg pregnant cows. Because when we do these heat stress uh, transition cow uh, studies, if the cows are not cooled uh, during the summer or during heat stress, their inflammation, their inflammatory markers are really high. I just showed it uh, recently. The TNF alpha can be sometimes three or four folds higher during heat stress relative to the winter. So I think that, you know, sometimes producers tend to think more on the fresh cows and what's happening when they start giving milk. But it's really, really important to understand that many of these infl infl inflammatory processes begin uh, at late uh, gestation and uh, specifically with heat stress, don't forget to give them the best management, cooling, whatever they need to go into lactation in a good state. <clears throat> well, I think a couple of things, you know, one from, from my own lab is, um, I think we've helped um, people sort of maybe not fear looking to feed the supplemental fatty acids in that fresh cow uh, peak period. I think there's a lot of opportunities around improving milk production, production efficiency, minimizing body weight gain. And there's a lot we still need to know on the basic and the applied side, but I think uh, that work has helped to move that forward and has some, you know, immediate real life, you know, application right now. And the other thing I took away from this meeting is, you know, I think for me learning more and more about the importance of immune activation and the immune system um, throughout this whole transition period and for me needed to think more about how our labs work impacts that side of it you know i focus more on you know production body weight you know maybe we need to think more about that and that that, that i think that's probably coming from multiple angles and the importance of trying to understand um, the immune system and that drop off in the intake in certain situations in that in that dry cow but really trying to help us understand what role the immune system seems to be having across this whole and how is it being activated across this whole period seems to be a big, big area that we can hopefully make some advances in going forward. Thank you. Uh, Laura? A couple things I didn't address, like the other part of what we do, because I just talked about hypocalcemia in general, but, um, you know, we're still working on using um, the precursor to serotonin to manipulate calcium and trying to understand better how that happens. Um, and so we still do some of that work and how it might integrate with all of these things. Um, and then second, uh, I really think understanding the integration is key. Uh, calcium, energy, all of these things, I think, really work together. And we don't really know, you know, how what the circle is. And if there is a circle, uh, we know a lot of things related to the drop in calcium and what happens after that. But at least from what we can tell right now, there, like everyone has said, there's things happening during that late pregnancy period that we don't fully understand that drives this. Um, and so I really think it's a critical to understand that integration because I, I think we keep things way too compartmentalized. Um, and how we can sort that out, I think might help us better, you know, from a dietary standpoint, would there be a way to monitor this easily before they calve? Because I really think trying to monitor everything right after they calve in that period is like opening up a black box and also um, impacting an animal who probably just wants you to go away. <laughs> <laughs> Unless like she really needs help. I mean, she just wants to like get through it and try it and try to be effective. And so I'm hoping that we can sort some of that out, at least, you know, preliminarily and, you know, help it integrate with what everyone else is doing, because I think that's the way forward to really understand what's happening. And so that's really our goal um, in what we're trying to do. And um, I hope it works out. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, my, Megan will be done running assays sometime in the near future, so I have some more information, but uh yeah, she just did a tremendous job on that project. And I think we're going to really learn a lot about it um, in terms of homeostasis and homeoresis, which is integrating everything we all do. Great. Tyler? Yeah, I think one of my big takeaways builds on what Laura was talking about. And we've certainly talked about it today, but having some way to have a measure of how cows are doing 
um, in terms of intake, metabolism, uh, you know, health, all of these things. So I think there's so many tools out there, both available widely as sensors, but also so many of us are working on these. So for each farm, it might be something different. Maybe it's a, a DHI milk-based monitor coming out monthly. Maybe it's a rumination sensor or something, but some way to have your thumb on the health of the herd and the production of the herd. And one thing that came up a lot and really resonated with, with me was, does a farm need these tools or do they just need somebody with good cow sense? And the chat box would just fill up with people saying they, they need people with good cow sense, but sometimes you don't have that. And I think no matter how good your team is, you can always benefit from tools, just like we do in research. And so when we're doing the research, having a way to, to take it to farm and an applied tool is, is really still needed. And so that validated for me that a lot of what we're doing across all of our labs here today is, is useful. The other takeaway that I have is this concept of conditionally essential is what Tom Overton referred to it as. But we know the transition period is unique. It's probably unique between, or it is unique between primiparous and multiparous animals as well. So understanding what the true requirements are in that period, and they're going to be different than what we consider required for the rest of lactation. Um, and so as we work to understand that better, Joe mentioned uh, methyl donors and amino acids. We've talked about fatty acids. These are things that the transition cow needs in order to reach her full potential. And I think we still have some room to go, but there's certainly been a lot of new knowledge on what we can integrate into rations right now uh, to help the transition cow do the best. And there's also some nutrition by management interaction there. Maybe you have a pre-fresh pen, but not a post-fresh pen or vice versa. And I think we have some tools that can help farms no matter what their restrictions or constraints are. I just wanted to add that one of my, just sorry, the one of the outcomes that I'm the happiest uh, from this meeting is getting to know my dear colleagues here from this session. It was a great opportunity and thank you guys. I agree with that. Hey, folks, I just noticed that uh, Dr. Larry Miller has uh, entered the pub. Would you mind if I join, uh, ask him to join us? Well, that'd be great. Joe and I can give him some grief about how hard we worked. <laughs> Dr. Miller, I've heard some very positive things about this week's virtual conference. Many conferences have had to, to go virtual this past year, and they've all had some challenges with organizing them successfully. That's not been the case with the Discover Conference, so kudos to you and your team. Um, the Discover Conference has built a reputation for being one of the best dairy science conferences around. Can you give us some background on how it came about and what are the overall objectives of the conference? Okay, uh, thank you, Scott. Um, yes, the, the conferences, uh, Discover Conferences, are, are selected by a, a, a criteria that include, uh, is the topic important and timely? And is, it, is there adequate science for a two and a half day in-depth presentations and discussions? And would there be adequate interest and support? We set up the uh, program and developed a program and then had to go back later and develop a virtual program as you are aware. Yeah, well, we got uh, great interest in that. And actually the conference sold out uh, a few days before the early registration date. And so, we end up with 229 uh, registrants uh, representing 24 countries, 29 states, and 32 universities from around the world. Uh, in addition to that, we provided an, a viewers uh, only option and where they would not be part of the live conference, but they would have access to the pre-recorded presentations and a recording of the discussion periods. And we had another 77 sign up for, for that. So we had over 300 people in total involved in, in the process. The conference was organized around five themes of which the first one was physiology. And we appreciate the support from Balcam for this uh, session and it went quite well. So we, uh, we felt uh, very good about it. We're getting uh, responses, emails coming in saying this is the Several of them saying this is the best virtual conference they've been involved this year. And as you realize, many people have been on many <laughs> Zoom and different kind of virtual uh, settings this year. And so that's quite a compliment. I would point out that these, um, uh, your presentations for 
Um, the Real Science Exchange is just another extension of the discussion for, on this topic of physiology related to the transition cow and to re reach an even broader audience that we did, you know, in, in the Discover conferences. No, I just like to say we really appreciate the opportunity as well to be associated uh, uh, with the Discover conference. Um, now, this was the 39th Discover conference, and I understand you've got the 40th scheduled. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about uh, that and how people can register for that conference? The 40th uh, Discover conference is <coughs> the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, NASEM. This uh, replaced the NRC, the National Research Council, which had been in, uh, in, in place for many years in the National Academies. And uh, the conference is the NASEM uh, Nutrient Requirements of Dairy Cattle. And this is uh, the last revision. This is the eighth revision in, in the history of the a revision of the nutrient requirements for dairy cattle. Uh, the last one, the seventh one, was published in um, 2001. So when these are released uh, in hopefully early 2021, uh, it'll be 10 years. And obviously, as you probably appreciate, there have been many changes relative to nutrient requirements. And, and um, this one will be a very popular one, as indicated early by the early registrations that we have at this point. We anticipate uh, a sellout. We can't guarantee that, but I think, as you probably recognize, this is a well, it impacts many uh, not only companies but producers and researchers and, and on and on. And they will present an overview of each chapter of the study. Uh, and uh, some of them have uh, significant uh, changes in them from some 10 years ago. And others would be primarily updates to information and maybe updates to models and so forth. The concept of the discussion, uh, like the Discover conferences, where you do have discussion periods, brief present, relatively brief presentations, uh, discussion where everybody can be involved and, and sometimes even uh, break into smaller breakout groups for even more detailed uh, discussion at times. And this is what really distinguishes Discover Commons from many other meetings and symposia and so forth, where you get the interaction. We look forward to your participation as well as uh, others, but I, I know a few have representatives that want to register. Um, I don't think you had to rush out this week. I think within the next couple of three months that this thing will be sold out. Um, okay, www.adsa.org slash meetings slash 40th dash discover dash conference. Um, I said it at the beginning, and I will say it again, that Discover Conference, it's quite unique, and it's one of the best uh, dairy science conferences around, and, and uh, a lot of that's owed to you, Dr. Miller, and, and organizing it. So congratulations. Great job. Um, <clears throat> I see that uh, Heather's cla glass is 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 empty again. And we have a rule here at the Real Science Exchange that the last one to arrive must buy the next round. Uh, are, are, are you good with that? Uh, yes, that'll, that'll be fine. <laughs> All right, very well. Folks, it's getting late and it looks like we're going to be here a bit longer. So if you've enjoyed your time here at the exchange, tell a friend and drop us a five star on your way out. And we'll see you next time at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour, the conversation is sometimes saucy, and you're always among friends.